Are you suggesting that someone's trying to make a real life sequel? Stab two? Who'd want to do that? Sequels suck. No, no. Come on. Hey guys, welcome back to Spooky Tuesday. I'm Sydney Thompson. I'm Monica Height. And I'm Chelsea Duff. And this week we're talking about Scream 2, which is probably out of the whole Scream franchise on the bottom rung <laughs> of Scream movies, but still a banger through and through. I had a great time. What did you guys have you think? Even, have you even seen Scream 4 yet, Monica? I haven't seen Scream 4, okay, but you just told me today that Emma Roberts is in it, so I'm not looking forward to watching it now. Really ruined the surprise for me. <laughs> well, I, I hope Emma Roberts won't be the only surprise in that movie for you. I hope there will be more <laughs> moments that um, excite and entice you but i agree i think i think scream 2 and scream 4 are weaker entries into the franchise and i have a lot of notes for scream 4 um and what i would have liked to have seen there instead i will hold off on sharing those now until we and yeah until at least you have watched the movie hopefully our <laughs> listeners as well but at least until monica has watched the movie i won't say anything um scream 2 i don't have a lot of notes on what i thought they could have done better necessarily i just have um some complaints because i am a hater you know i i too am a hater and so i'm excited to hear your complaints the one thing i will say just right off the bat they made a good choice i'll give them some kudos because they named it scream 2 but apparently they were also <laughs> considering the names scream again scream no. <laughs> louder and scream the sequel which makes it sound like a musical to me a little bit scream the musical <laughs> scream the sequel the musical the disney channel original <laughs> production disney plus whatever you know i could get behind if they do it like the little high school musical show scream louder i just think is the worst thing i've ever heard I like Scream Again. That is, uh, I'm very upset that that didn't make the cut. But then it would have turned into an, an I know what you did last summer thing, which is like, I still know what you did last summer. <laughs> I'll never forget what you did last summer. Like, I swear to God, I have it written down. I'm never going to fucking forget what you did last summer. Like, the, I hated that. I hated yeah. that. <laughs> I thought that was fun. Well, there were originally... This is another IMDb. There were originally um, some things in this script that would have meant Scream 2 was like the only other Scream. So Scream Again, I think, would have been okay if it were only ever two movies. But within a larger franchise, yeah, I think Scream Again would have been like Scream Again Again. Like Scream three more times. Like you get into some funky territory. Scream three times like the Usher song. I would the have fifth one that. is just like, will you shut up? Oh my God. I'm so glad that it didn't turn out to just be two movies because we all know that the next movie is the best one and the greatest film ever made. But, you know, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I'm just so excited to get to the next episode. <laughs> I will say I'm so happy that we're talking about Scream 2 because then we get to talk about Scream 3 of which there is a scene that I would like to be on my tombstone. Um, <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. Oh, Everybody know. else will have to wait to find out. Um, but Are you enticed to keep listening, listeners? You should wow. be. <laughs> That's a little kind of be clickbait if you don't have to click anything and we're just like still going. Verbal click didn't click me. <laughs> audio, audio clickbait. Um, anyway, there are some great scenes and some really great moments in this movie. First of all, like top of the list is the opening. Oh, um, agreed. The opening is so great and so iconic. And I I think I told you guys last time, I think I'd seen Scary Movie before I had ever seen Scream. And I definitely had seen the rest of the Scary Movies before I saw any other. Don't laugh at me. Um, Chelsea. I, look, they're... They're, they're general horror parodies. I didn't realize they were so specific on some levels. Mm -hmm. um, I had seen the rest of the scary movies before I had seen any of the other screams for sure. And I didn't know the scene with Brenda in the movie theater was like referencing anything. Until like directly. Di so, so unbelievably directly until we watched Scream 2 with our OG spooky crew. And then I was like, Oh, 
My eyes are opened to the world. <laughs> okay, but is this Jada's best role that she has ever done? Um, I've not seen like any of her other roles, so except except what was that movie we watched in Spooky Crew? Um, Demon Knight Tales from the Crypt, something yes. like that. That was a better role for me, honestly. She slayed in that one. <laughs> she did slay in that one. She did get fully covered in fake blood, which you know is a thing for us. Um, mm -hmm. Very hot, very she hot. Gets a lot of points for that. I would say, you know, that movie gave more for her to do because it was a full length movie. Yes. Um, <laughs> So it's hard to compare. I will argue that in this 12 minutes, she literally kills it. Like, yeah. she's so good in this. And she is everybody watching this movie. Like, why are you doing this? Why don't you just call? Like, Star 69 his ass. Are you oh. kidding me? That was such a good quote. <laughs> you know, they got a lot of um, critical complaints about the first one with like, why wasn't Star 69 thing? Like, why wasn't Caller ID a thing? Like, why are there no black characters? And they were just like, what if we have Jada cover every single beat in the first 12 minutes and then <laughs> we can just move on and pretend that it was a flawless film? <laughs> she, they, she just came in with this big old band-aid and just placed it over all the flaws of the last movie. I also just love that she, like, fucking hams it up so hard in this scene. It's so good. I just, one, I think her and Omar Epps are a very hot on-screen couple. Mm -hmm. And I just mm -hmm. want to attend any anything that was as lit as this movie premiere. Like, this is killing me. It makes me want to go to a rowdy screening, a screening at Draft House so bad, but we can't fucking do that because we can't fucking do anything. Ugh, oh, it just seems amazing. I have questions about the rowdiness of this screening, though, because it's like a sneak preview for Stab. It's the first Stab movie. Like... Nobody has seen it yet, but they're getting Ooh. this insane in the theater. Like, how many copies of Gail's book did she sell? Like, was that book so insane? That's a seller. Are, okay, I just was... Hmm, true crime is, like, such a thing now that I could see this film getting, like, pumped up on all the true crime podcast shout-outs to the fact that other podcasts exist, I guess. Um, <laughs> and... I could see it having like a lot of organic buzz, you know what I mean? But to the degree that everybody is not trying to actually hear the movie is a little strange to me. Like it's you go to a rowdy so cat screening, you've already seen cats or you don't give a fuck about cats. You know what I mean? Like you're there to have a good time. But if you're this invested in this true crime story, like you don't you want to see it on screen for the first time this is the first time you're seeing it it's not like you saw it opening weekend you come back for your fifth showing and now you're gonna get crazy because you can quote along with the movie and you can shout back to it it's like you don't know what's gonna happen yet this had the truly bizarre rowdy energy of like a screening of the room you know like throwing spins yes. at the right point also same thing as like going to a screening of rocky horror picture show yes. like these people looked like practice they knew what the hell they were doing and they were all like dressed in costume they were all I mean they had flying ghosts face yeah I mean they yeah, gave they those like costumes out like the usher gave them to um I think their names are Phil and Maureen I just called them Omar and Jada in my notes um <laughs> but they do have the names are important yeah they the names are important they gave them the costumes when they walked into the theater so like it explains oh, why they all have costumes that they didn't all like show up prepared in cosplay. Totally. Like, you know what I mean? You want to know a quick fun fact about that usher? The usher yeah. who gave them the the costumes at the beginning won an MTV award or not award contest to be in the movie. So that woman like won an award, and that was her big role in the first minute. I'm happy for her. <laughs> big career ahead I would love to see her <laughs> next role you know what I, I mean know. like where did she go I, from here um I'll look I into just it. I feel like the reception they gave stab is the reception that scream to got and so they were mirroring that a little bit like that anticipated mm, I that came out a little wrong but like that anticipatory energy you know what I mean 
where everybody is like already so here for it but that's totally. because the first movie already came out you know what i mean and the first movie like performed so well that they had it in theaters like for months and months and months um but that's because you saw it and then you kept going back to see it not because the first <laughs> time you saw it you were already in costume shouting at the screen like people would punch you they'd be like shut up i'm trying to watch this your disbelief here but i think I just, it just isn't gonna make sense it's just not <laughs> i just feel like if people are heckling jada for heckling the movie but they're oh. also all shouting like shut up <laughs> that pissed me off so much i was like oh okay so when she says something fucking smart you're mad at her but you guys are going like stab her uh, she's naked like okay that's what really adding to the commentary thank you she was you know you're you go see a movie because you want to see people get murdered i don't want to see them survive i don't want sure. i don't need somebody in the audience telling the person that i want dead how to survive okay but i definitely watched a different scary movie this week and i was screaming at the tv why don't you just freaking call 911 god damn it <laughs> and so you know sometimes you just gotta tell them that they're fucking stupid <laughs> listen jada was speaking the truth her mm -hmm. advice was not wrong but it is not what the people wanted to hear at that exact moment the people wanted the unnecessary nudity of a shower scene. They didn't want to hear, why is she getting in the shower? Why is she not putting clothes on? You know what I mean? Like, they didn't want that essential feedback. Like, Jada was right. Jada didn't say anything wrong throughout this entire opening. Um, she was flawless. I have no complaints about Jada or about Omar. I also thought he did great. I would like to talk um, on the subject of Omar's death scene. Phil, excuse me. Bill, what's his name? Phil Stevens. Death Steven. Um, yes. He gets stabbed in the bathroom, but he gets stabbed in the ear in the bathroom because he's like leaning up against the stall to whisper to, or to listen to these like little whispers. And Monica, I know you said you missed it the first time we watched it. I missed it. But what the fuck is that about? Where Ghostface oh is like. God. No, he, but he's it's literally like, saying. Why? He's literally saying something like, like, mommy, mommy. I'm a little boy or something like that. I'm not kidding. Like he literally says mommy something about a little boy. And I was like, what in the actual fuck? I don't blame, I don't blame whatever his name, Phil, for putting his ear to the door. Cause I would want to know too. <laughs> it is great foreshadowing though. Oh, for so sure. we can appreciate that. I just, I want to know, I have some logistical things oh about this God. death that don't make sense to me. One, how did they know? Did they just know they would be at this premiere? Two, how did he know he would go to the bathroom and that there would be two other people dressed in scream masks, slow peeing, so he would be forced <laughs> this to... This is Lois Piers. <laughs> so he would then be forced to go into a stall to pee. And then how did he know exactly where his ear would be so he could just jam the knife through a door would that even work how okay. much force would you need to jam a knife through the through metal. A stall door <laughs> to then kill a man and then once he's killed him how did he know where jada was sitting in the theater i, I have some answers for you not a okay. lot um Please these are these answers. made up right now but <laughs> I believe, I believe anything you say. <laughs> thank you. I believe with my whole heart that, um, can we say the killers right now? I know we, there's a blanket expectation that you guys have already watched this movie. If you're listening to this episode, but I just want to make sure we're not like easing into saying the killers. Like, can I say the killers right now? You know what? I mean, we're, I mean, we're going to say it right now. Spoiler alert. I gave you a warning last episode, so you better have fucking watched it or I will cry or get very angry. I'm not sure I'm feeling spicier today than last episode. Mm. Um, but oh. go ahead. Go ahead, Chelsea. Let them know. Okay. Um, so we know the killers are Mickey and Mrs. Loomis, Billy's mommy. Um, and so I do think that kind of explains if he's saying like, mommy, mommy, or whatever in the stall, that is just Mickey getting into character, trying to channel Billy's energy. You know what I mean? Um, trying to be like Billy's whole motivation was that he was sad because his mommy left him. So Mickey's being like, how do I be such a fucko like Billy? Let me, such just, a fucko. Yeah, let me just take a little moment and be like, I miss my mommy. Um, I also think he must have been the one 
to orchestrate, um, you know, he works in the film studies program or whatever. Like if this is a Windsor College early screening, perhaps he somehow um, got onto the committee organizing it, made sure that Mm. Maureen Evans and Phil Stevens got screener tickets, made sure that two students with kidney stones also got tickets so that they would be in the bathroom having trouble <laughs> and just having like a slur. <laughs> Kids would have just having a slow dribble of a pee. <laughs> Of that inevitably when people had to go to the bathroom they would have to use I'm crying <laughs> they would have to use the stall um he, <laughs> he, he knows that Phil Stevens is like a frequent peer you know what I mean like he just did his research and that's why he's, he's like oh he's got a tiny yeah. fucking bladder okay, yeah he's like I know he's gonna have to go to the bathroom otherwise he would have just made a different murder plan um so that's why he waits for Phil Stevens to come in he's you know he has been working on this for a long time it took a lot of planning he's so a fucking psychopath I mean, this is yeah. his whole thing it's like his first three victims are all people who are mirroring the first three victims in the first scream um and in the first woodsboro murders which is maureen prescott sydney's mom um casey drew barrymore and steve drew barrymore's boyfriend so you know there's a lot of thought that's gone into this so i think it's reasonable to assume that he knows Phil pees a lot. He knows if he can get Phil there, he can orchestrate what seat he's sitting in maybe. Like maybe he gave them specific tickets. Maybe they don't just like find seats. Maybe it's like how today you're assigned a seat in a lot of movie theaters. So that's where how he knew where Jada was. Cause he just, or he's just observing in the back. back. Yeah, also Jada was not wearing a costume like almost everybody else was. So in her little um, raspberry cami cardigan set maybe she just stood out um but so he goes to her immediately i mean there's no real explanation um for how he stabbed through the metal with such ease other than i don't think it was metal i think it was like the the um fiber wood or whatever particle board kind of Mm -hmm. ones Mm -hmm. okay that's a good idea that makes more sense yeah my only other suggestion was like Stu in the first one he just got yoked you know (laughs) or he had that like that like i'm about to kill adrenaline rush and was i just hulked it yes i will say he is a lot um to the naked eye at least he appears to be much physically stronger than both billy and Mm -hmm. Stu did he's a lot um I don't want to say hunkier because we all know of our love for Billy and Stu, but beefier no, for he's, sure. He's a, yeah, he's a little bit of a, a beefcake in that way. Well, you know, for me, I just, I don't know what it was, probably everything, but the, the stab in the ear, I really didn't see it coming. And I forgot, I just watched this a month and a half ago. I, that's just like probably the most horrifying thing I can ever imagine. You're hearing someone having a mental breakdown and you're like, hot goss. And then all of a sudden your brain has been stabbed. <laughs> Maybe you feel it less than like being stabbed in the stomach though. I feel, well, he did kind of take a while to die. You know, I kind of assumed yeah. this is so dumb. I'm realizing how dumb I am now. Um, I was thinking because of The Walking Dead that the second that you your brain gets touched by a knife, you just um, disintegrate, basically. But there are whole, like, people that we studied in psychology class in high school and stuff who got a whole pipe through the brain and, oh, like, yeah. survived but just had major personality shifts. So that, yeah, that so he could have just – he could have yeah. survived and just been a changed man, but unfortunately it didn't go that way. It didn't so go what, that way. The one thing that I really also really enjoyed was that the killer, Ghostface, recognized how absolutely incredible that brown leather jacket was mm-hmm. that Phil was wearing. And he's yes. like, all right, I'm copying this right now. Not because of the, the whole cost, how he needed to be disguised as Phil. That's not why. It was because it was a sexy jacket and he wanted to look fly and I'm happy for him. And he made that fashion choice because he doesn't make fashion choices like that the rest of the film and it was daring and it was it was well received by me 
he really did take a risk with that beautiful, beautiful brown leather jacket. Mm-hmm. And then the brown leather jacket was also covered in blood. Oof. The beautiful. ultimate accessory. I hope they can get that out. I hope they save that from the crime scene so it can be worn again, even though it's covered did in death. Did he leave death. it behind? Did we, did we see that? If he left it behind or if he took it with him to add to his wardrobe later on? I think we just see him leave. Like, he just exits screen right. And therefore, we just assume he was like, I have this. This is mine now. This is mine. I will take it off as soon as I get outside so that I can blend back into the masses. But I just have it underneath my robe now, my my ghost face killer robe. And I'm just holding it close to my heart as I scurry on home. It's like, I'm going to wear this to Friday's frat party and I'm going to look fly as hell. (laughs) Also, as lit as all the people in the theater were, the slow realization that you see on their faces when they realize that Jada has just been actually murdered would be so traumatizing. (laughs) Seriously, like that one girl who like, she gets stabbed right next, Jada gets stabbed right next to her and then all of a sudden she's like, oh, there's actual blood on my arm. What the fuck is this? Like that was like the first person who started to realize. And I just got to say that like, God, Jada's, Wilhelm scream is that a Wilhelm scream when she's like ah mm-hmm. <laughs> like only the Wilhelm scream is the Wilhelm scream but like okay. I know what you're going you for know what? and okay. I appreciate but it's it. like that <laughs> yeah it's as iconic as that seriously <sighs> she just really like <sighs> I just love that she does that huge scream she falls to the ground and then she's like immediately dead and like vacant <laughs> <laughs> I was like you like I don't know it's not overacting because it was perfect, but it was outrageously <laughs> dramatic. And I wanted it to her. be just as big as it was. Yeah. No, it, it, needed, it needed to be, to that, be big. that big. Like, Jada is up there with Billy on Drama Queen level oh. at that point. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. I would also mm-hmm. say that they, they should have considered um, just create just cutting that part of the film out of the rest of the film and submitting it to film festivals you know like can uh con i don't know how you say that one you know tribeca all of those just as like a short film entry because i feel like it's definitely um serious film there and it really it could have won some awards it really could have besides like probably mtv movie award best (laughs) death (laughs) which is the most respectable movie awards in the 90s Yes. Oh, I would agree. There was a lot of clout with that back then. Okay, and so Jada is dead, and we are now back to Sydney, and Sydney is rocking short hair and a Ooh. sports bra. <gasps> it's so hot and so even more overtly gay than the last film. Like, you can't really, he can't so deny gay. it anymore. <laughs> oh, Ooh, Sydney. Like, big lesbian vibes. And I, too, discovered my sexuality in college after getting a bob, so I really <laughs> related to this. <laughs> the most relatable part of the story for Monica. <laughs> but I have another issue. We're seeing Sydney's roommate and her friend, Hallie. Mm-hmm. Whose college dorm room is that nice? Mm-hmm. Why is it, like... You know, I guess I kind of thought they were in... A sorority house, which again doesn't make sense because Sydney doesn't want to join the sorority house. No, it's just a regular dorm. And I also love we get another nod to Chelsea had to point it out uh, when we were watching it. We had a Freddy, she, uh, they just have the Freddy Krueger sweater in their dorm room. Hallie's like, I love a little homage. Oh, God. Why would Sydney want something from a scary thing in her fucking room at night? This doesn't make any sense, but whatever. Well, I like friends it. she's with Randy, and Randy is his own whole scary thing. So, you know, I guess she's got some tolerance for it. Speaking of scary and Randy, that goatee was the scariest part of the movie. He did somehow look hotter than the first one, like a little bit, but then immediately scarier and grodier because of the goatee. I was very confused. I did write in my notes, Randy's beard, no. Um, mm-hmm. But I yeah. think it's very in character for Randy to be like, I'm in college now. I got to get some facial hair. I'm going to get some ladies with this goatee. Like, no, you're not, but I can see why you would <sighs> think that. I also feel like all college film boys have goatees so that's just Mm. very on brand for randy if not a physical one a metaphorical one for sure (laughs) Mm. but just why is gail 
Like, why Why did Gail show up? You know what I mean? Of also, rocking she showed up. Bob and chunky red highlights. Um, okay. I love the red hair, but it did disappear throughout the film. It did. It did. That was a big continu- continuity error there, Wes. We're, we're, we're critiquing you now. We noticed these things. But I liked them in the beginning. And I also liked that Dewey made fun of her for them. Um, but the- <laughs> Dewey stood up for himself. Oh, yeah. And, and also, I just really loved Dewey's entrance to the film. If you recall, Sydney just looks across the lawn, and Dewey is just, like, like kind of tripping on his own feet, looking at a tree, like, looking like he has no idea where he is or what, like, state he's in, even. And I was like, oh, this is so classic, Dewey. Someone please help this man. <laughs> okay, but also... The sexual tension between Dewey and Sydney in that moment is so bad. What? Like it's it's palpable, but it is it makes me uncomfortable because it's like one, that is your dead sister's best friend who you now see as like I must protect her. You are my new sister because my sister died. Um is this where our generations love for step sibling porn. No, 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 no. no. Don't I say have that. Been, I've been making the most disgusted face for so long that my face started twitching and now it hurts. What the fuck? I didn't notice it at all. What okay. are you talking about? Monica's wrong because I did also notice it and it was palpable. Um, I, I was making was- salsa while I watched that part, so that might be why. <laughs> I first of all, I would like to put some respect on life with Derek's name. Like that's where the step sibling thing comes from. Um, so don't say it. this. Don't give the credit to Dewey. Oh my god! They absolutely don't with deserve it. Um, okay, but uh, Scream had Scream Two had to walk, so life with Derek could run. No, I disagree. I think this was accidental, and I don't know why it was there and how it made it. It's just a blip. I think they were just trying to imply that there is like a non-sexual intimacy between them because of what they've been through. I like that better. Because Tatum um, forever binds them together, although they never said her name once in this movie. Please, please pay Tatum her dues. Like, I would love to see Sydney acknowledging that her boyfriend being a serial killer is not the only trauma she's carrying. I would love yeah. to Dewey acknowledging that he ever had a sister in the first place because, like, we can read it into his character, but it's not within the script of the movie. Like, it's not on the page. Mm. Justice for Paige. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that for, from this movie, you wouldn't know if her name was Paige or Tatum because they never fucking <laughs> mention it either way. Yeah, I think oh, um, with a character as iconic from the first one as she was, I would have liked to have seen more acknowledgments of her. You know what I mean? Because, like, obviously Maureen Prescott still plays a role. Like, Steve and Casey also get their little tribute with the deaths. Um, They kind of ditch the pattern after that point. Like, they're not really going after everybody else. Unless you're saying that Hallie being a target is a surrogate for... Sydney's original best friend Tatum being a target. I could see that. Which you can because Hallie is dating Mickey, and so it's like the killer kills his girlfriend slash Sydney's best friend. Are um, they actually dating in the movie? So, right. They have that one moment where Mickey's like, "You want to dance?" and she's like, "Oh yeah, I want to dance with that guy over there." And in my mind, she's pointing at Matthew Lillard because Matthew Lillard <laughs> makes a cameo in that scene. So in my mind, it's him. <laughs> I mean, I would much rather want to dance with Matthew Lillard than Mickey any day of the week. And speaking of Matthew Lillard and giving homage to old characters, they only bring up Stu like one fucking time. And it's Randy and he calls him something mean, which is accurate, but I was offended. <laughs> What does he say? He calls no, him. No, he's talking about Billy. No, he talks about Billy and he talks about Stu. He says, why would you want to copy yourself off of two high school loser ass dickheads? Stu was a pussy oh ass God. wet rag and Billy Loomis. Billy Loomis, what the fuck? Talk about a rat looking homo replaced mama's boy. <laughs> <laughs> the only time you heard about Stu, though. <laughs> 
that is just an absolutely vicious burn. Um, oh, and yeah, it is. I, I don't know about repressed part because, again, as we've discussed, the the gayness feels pretty inherent to the canon in Scream mm-hmm. 1, so homo repressed, I don't know about that. Um, although we did have like- discussions about that where we were like, is he repressing? That's why he's mad at Sydney partially. Um, but I, think- I just like that it's acknowledged in this film. Yeah. They say they, the they, word. <laughs> a little rewriting of history, but they're like, okay, fine. If you want gay Billy, here's gay Billy. We always want gay Billy. It's canon at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it lives on the internet now, therefore it exists. <laughs> okay, I will say we gave Randy a lot of shit um, last episode because we were like, Randy should have died and Tatum should have lived. I do feel that Randy earns his keep in Scream 2 and then goes on to have um, his memory honored in Scream 3. Um, So I think once he did survive to the end, you know what I mean? Like, he didn't deserve the death that he got. Yeah, that sucked. (laughs) Yeah. Like, it's it's super vicious. Um, And again, we get kind of an explanation for that at the end when Mrs. Loomis says, like, that was actually her. Like, she was the killer at that point. And when he insulted Billy, she, like, lost her shit a little bit and was a little, I think she said, like, knife happy, maybe. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, kudos to her that she can, like, recognize that in herself. Like, the first step to getting better is, like, acknowledging you have a problem. Um, but 100%. it was it was too much. <laughs> it was not fair to Randy. Um, but also, Randy is still hyper-focused on Sydney and, like, shut up and move on. Oh, my God. He is so annoying. Like, at the beginning, he's like, if I wrote the movie, I would have the geek get the girl. And I was like, just shut the fuck up and, like, find someone else to be obsessed with. And here's the thing, too. Right now, uh, the geek gets the girl most of the time because the geek is now becoming like a tech billionaire. And so, <laughs> so like, how can I get with the geek? For real. Even in a lot of 80s movies, like, the geek got the girl and stuff like that because it was like a whole geek resurgence thing. You know what I mean? Like, one of the only times that I can think of that the geek doesn't get the girl is 16 candles um no wait am i thinking mm, some molly ringwald movie either pretty and pink it's or 16, 16 candles. Can- it's 16 candles because mm-hmm. Jake ryan are you kidding me oh, i would never in pretty and pink she also ends up with the hottie so okay john hughes knew what he was doing um <laughs> and thank you to john hughes because like no offense to the geek but like if the hawkeye is also nice like you're gonna pick the hawkeye um you be a geek and be hot okay (laughs) yeah first of all randy um just be hotter but there was a (laughs) woman that there was some moment where somebody who was it somebody called oh maybe it was the hmm somebody called randy Sydney's love slave or something? No, like he that. calls himself yeah. that. This is the quote. This is the quote. It's Dewey and Randy talking in Kirkhoff Coffee House at UCLA. It's not where it actually, <laughs> that's where it was shot. Okay. I went to UCLA, so this is very visceral for me. And um, Randy says, Come on, it's me, Randy, the unrequited love slave of Lit- Cindy Prescott. Cindy, Sydney Prescott. I know all about obsession. And then he like shows his scar from where he got shot. And then he says, and pain. Very dramatic. Okay. <laughs> Hate everything about that. Hate. Um, just, you know, we talked about it a little last episode. Like, I'm here for a simp. I think simping can be great. I think you still have to have that respect women aspect to it, though. And for me, while I do think Randy respects Sydney, um, not enough to respect the fact that she's not interested and you need to move on. And also he's doing what men so often do when they complain that they've been friend zoned is they put this woman like up on a whole pedestal that makes yep. her perfect in their eyes, which also means that the second that she does anything wrong, it's like you are the worst person that ever existed on this earth because you've disappointed me. Um, and so I just feel like Randy is teetering a little too close into the territory. And the fact that he knows it and calls himself the unrequited unre- love slave, like, again, acknowledging He's that you have a problem. He's tipping into step, 
But, like, take the next step, Randy. He's tipping into incel territory, and we just can't be having that. Also, at the beginning, Sydney's like, this shit is happening again. We are going to be targets soon. And Randy's like, no, you're stupid. Um, okay, and then you die because you were mean to Sydney when she was right. Like, you have to support your friends when they think that you're about to be murdered. So, come on. Especially, you've been in a situation where you were almost murdered before. So, like... Just take it with, a, yeah. like, just a little faith, maybe. Like, she knows what she's talking about. To it is in the realm of pro- possibility, for sure. <laughs> I just also love that Randy says his favorite scary movie is Showgirls. Oh, yes, that's okay, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, Randy. I was very sad. I was like, okay, Randy's, like, really funny. Dead. <laughs> dead. The second dead. that Randy sad. really starts to shine in this movie, dead. He just yeah. gets dead, and it's unfair for Randy. There, there's an unwritten rule in all horror films that he didn't even know about, but it's that if you have a grody goatee, you die, and he should have <laughs> known. Honestly, fair. Okay, so we've talked about Randy's death, I will say, in very detailed things. What are your sure. other favorite deaths? We've done Omar Epps, great death. Randy, oh, so good. Um, could have had a better death, but still, yeah, we love. Could have had a more dignified death, I think. I just he got got in the middle of the day, and then uh, they leave the ghost mask in the car. I feel like DNA had to exist in the nineties, like mm-hmm. a rookie mistake on Ghostface. Mm-hmm. Like, are they gonna have touch DNA where they can pull skin cells from the fabric? No, but. Do they probably have hairs? the capabilities at this point? Yeah, to do hairs with the, the little DNA bulb on the end? I think so. But I guess maybe that would take, like, two weeks to process, and realistically, the movie's only going to last, like, two more days. Yeah. yeah. True. Tops. But Let's her see. whole thing was that she was never going to get caught, and she was going to blame it all on, oh, but then at the end, she was also like, but if I do get caught, Debbie Saltz never existed. So I guess... But the DNA would not say Debbie Salt. No. Anyway, this, we need to move on from this point, but it's a valid point. <laughs> okay, favorite, favorite death, favorite death. Um, honestly, I really liked the one cop's death where he got impaled in the head with the pole from the car crash. Mm. Um, just because I was so mad at both of them for making those mean, like, death jokes to Sydney. They're like, if we have to tell you, we'll have to kill you. And then the other guy says, don't ask, don't tell. And then immediately gets his throat slashed. And I was like, yeah, bitch, that's what happens when you say problematic shit. You get your throat throat just slashed immediately by Ghostface. Scream 2 and Ghostface really said A cab. (laughs) Seriously. I just think... You, first of all, you've got people in your car who have survived murder attempts before. You know there are active murder attempts on them again. And you're going to be like, I'm going to threaten to kill you if I tell you where I'm taking to keep you safe. Like, first of all, I should be able to know where I'm going to be safe. I should be able to trust that you are keeping me safe. Like, you are going to be the one who also now makes me afraid, even if you're joking. Like, you got to know that that is not an okay joke to make. Um, Yeah. Also, they were just okay. terrible at their jobs the whole time. Yes, correct, true. Um, did not do much right other than when Cotton was getting way too close to Sydney, they did come up and be like, Cotton, back the fuck off. Um, but the, the reason that happened was because they were like, here, stand here next to an entrance and or exit to the library where anyone could run by and assault you, which is exactly what happened. Like, what? Oh, you're safe here right next to the hallway that leads to, like, the scary closet. Like, are you kidding me? Oh. I mean, I know um, incompetent movie cop is, like, such a trope with scary movies, but they do take it to the next level um, in a way that Dewey could and would never. Um, but I think other than Jada's death being like the death of the film, like the death of the whole franchise even maybe, um, I thought it wasn't my favorite, but I thought Cece's death, Sarah Michelle Geller, her death was unnecessarily brutal, like just Oof. awful. And then 
the killer has like stabbed her several times already she's gonna die because nobody well she's screaming very loud so maybe somebody <laughs> would have found her but then hoists her up and throws her over a balcony just like a little a little overkill if you ask me like you could just Huge kill overkill. her nicely right then instead you have to throw her over a balcony which is another um potentially unexplainable feat of strength but whatever. she's pretty small Sarah Michelle Geller is very tiny I feel like her getting yeeted off a balcony um makes sense to me like <laughs> i'm taking I, trivia seems to think that mrs loomis was the killer for um cc though which is interesting because in oh, my notes, mikey's at the party yeah he's at, he was at the party or mickey mickey sorry i wrote in my notes um that it was probably mrs loomis because she was there so fast for the reporting afterwards but it could be and like mickey was at the party um but I don't know, maybe there's wiggle room. But yeah, I think it's Mrs. Loomis. IMDb also was like, you can hear a female grunt on the stairs, which I did not hear. But I guess if you want yeah. to read into that, sure. A distinctively a, yeah. female grunt. You know it's those. What the proof. fuck? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know that Mrs. Loomis also clearly was doing her strength training if she's like tossing Sarah Michelle Geller over a balcony like a I was going to say a bag of flour, but actually I feel like a big bag of flour would be heavy. <laughs> totally. I just loved that whole scene because I was reading some trivia and there are so many in-jokes just within that one little part with Sarah Michelle Gellar. Mm -hmm. um, like when she's on the phone with her like female friend, um, female friend, that's, I was going to say girlfriend, but I hate that term. Anyway, it was Selma Blair. She was talking to Selma Blair, who's her co-star for Cruel Intentions, and they're talking about Party of Five, which is the show that Nev Campbell, by the way, it's Nev Campbell, not Neve <laughs> Campbell. Just a little update. I made, I, I got gaslit last episode. <laughs> no, you guys didn't gaslight me. You really thought that. It's fine. But it is Nev. Anyway, <laughs> so that's like the show where she got famous from. Um and yeah, and she's watching Nosferatu, which I've still never seen. But uh, who just this watches Nosferatu alone on a Saturday night? Um, apparently, though, Sarah Michelle Gellar agreed to be in this movie either before there was a script or before she ever saw a script. So they wrote the scene to include like as many references to Buffy the Vampire Slayer yeah. and like their other projects as they could, just for a little a little fun midway through the film. I love that. I love all the little in jokes. There's so many that we'll get into, but I just am so sad that Sarah Michelle Gellar died because I feel like we really missed a huge opportunity for Sydney to fall in love with her and for them to be gay <laughs> um, and together and Sydney to just like finally let herself live her truth, you know, because we love Derek. He's very hot. He's cute. He's a terrible singer. He likes to, he likes Top Gun apparently because apparently that's a thing. Um, from that movie but you know the chemistry wasn't there we all know it and honestly most of the movie they're like having a lot of discord anyway because yeah it was like somebody's trying to kill me last time it was my boyfriend don't know you that well because I think she's a freshman um they yeah. say that okay I do have some problems with the timeline real quick they say that it's been two years since the Woodsboro murders but also when they're at the movie in the beginning it says it's april 1997 um but the first movie came out in 1996 and was presumably set in 1996 so i just am not sure where that leaves us timeline wise um but i what read something that said it was supposed to take place the year after so maybe when they said the westboro mur murders were two years ago they met maureen the mom oh okay I, i'm odd. not sure but also they really like churned the shit out for this movie yes. because it came out like less than a year after the first scream came out so good for good for them they really were like oh you know what we're gonna make a lot of money all in 1997 <laughs> so there you go one of my favorite things that i know about this movie that's just like the stupid trivia you know about this movie is titanic and Scream 2 were supposed to come out on the same weekend, and Titanic moved their opening because they <laughs> didn't want to come out the same weekend as Scream 2. 
Yeah. Well, that was a good idea on James Cameron's part. <laughs> they were too nervous. Really to and scream me. too. Yeah. <laughs> scream one was such a sensation. Um, I don't know. I think Mich- sorry to get back to Michelle Geller. Sarah oh. Michelle Geller is her <laughs> name. a lot of names. A lot of names. I think Cece. Cece, I didn't um, necessarily get big gay energy from her, although I'm willing to see how she and Sydney played together. I don't think they were ever actually in a scene together. And Sarah no, Michelle Geller really didn't get much to do beyond um, – they did give her that – she was in the film class in the beginning – which she wasn't originally supposed to be in. That was supposed to be, like, some other character. But I guess maybe they felt like she wasn't fleshed out enough. Like, we weren't invested enough in her character. Mm-hmm. So I think it was smart to add her there. Um, I wish we had gotten more of who she was, though. I felt like a lot of characters in Scream 2 just, like, didn't have much of a personality. They were just assigned a film major. Um, <laughs> like, Derek is pre-med and Hallie is psychology and Sarah Michelle Geller presumably also film studies but like that's all that we get from a lot of the new characters in terms mm-hmm. of trying to figure out who they are um and that's a big complaint I have with Hallie specifically is that there's just not much given to her um or that we know about who she is and I felt like her addition especially combined with Jada in the beginning being like it's a movie about white girls getting their white asses killed. What did she say specifically? Um, I wrote that was such a good quote. Yeah, because I was like, okay, iconic. Um, she said, it's a dumbass white movie about some dumbass white girls getting their white asses cut the fuck up, okay? Um, and I felt like adding in the opening scene with Omar Epps and Jada Pinkett at the time, just Jada Pinkett, now Jada Pinkett Smith, um, and adding... Hallie as a character was meant to be like see we're making progress but other than Jada and Omar I just felt like it wasn't much progress because Hallie didn't get hardly any material Um, and they all ended up dead yes so that's (laughs) well the one fleshed out character of color is Joel and so he has a little he has some spice and some lines and I love him we need to talk about him more he's so fucking funny in this Joel is amazing. Um, again, he got a lot better roles or lines than Hallie. Hallie didn't really get any good lines other than the only thing I think I wrote down from her is she says at one point, I'm her therapist. And I was just like, to be clear, Sid needs actual therapy. Um, yes. <laughs> but the one thing that we do get from Hallie is we get the sorority girls that are just omnipresent in this movie. The Portia de Rossi oh and Rebecca Gay. Yes. And yeah. um, actually, that brings me back to something I started to touch on earlier, which is I didn't get gay energy from Sarah Michelle Geller, but I did feel like Portia and Rebecca Gayhart. I don't know if they were um, secretly hooking up or if they're both just independently like big um, feminine lesbian energy. You know what I mean? Or maybe it's like that they're both gay in the film. Yeah, or maybe it's that Portia's actually gay and the other girl's last name is Gay Heart. So that kind of like <laughs> puts it there already. I didn't sure. I didn't realize that was Portia. I had no idea that was Portia. And she was beautiful. I really think that she looks like sorority AU of Grimes in this film. Oh. Yeah. It eyebrows. really freaked me out. Yeah, it is the eyebrows for sure. The eyebrows in this movie are unhinged just sarah michelle gellers are so small portia de rossi's oh, so are so big <laughs> and you're just like they're beautiful they're luscious but like she could have given half of her eyebrows to sarah michelle geller and still would have had they each would have had a normal amount of eyebrow i wish that's how it worked because i could really use some more eyebrow <laughs> I don't know. I felt like they um, they were the the main gay energy that I got from this movie. Other than from Sydney, who we've established in our canon is gay. And I don't know. I think she did have, like, real love for Derek. Um, I don't know that she was in love with Derek. I think she does wear his letters still in Scream 3. I don't remember if she still has them in Scream 4. Um, I think a lot of that also, though, comes 
not from being passionately in love with him, but from having a lot of guilt about thinking that he could be capable of being the killer and also feeling responsible for his death because she didn't like untie him at the end fast enough for him to be able to defend himself at all. Um, that was devastating. Yeah. So I don't know if I want to like lean into like, is Sydney bisexual maybe? Um, I think she is full gay, but also sexuality is a spectrum. Um, sure. And Derek but, was nice and nice to look at. Yeah. Um, but so boring. And also if, if somebody did a singing dance number to me in public i would murder him like please don't sing the partridge family to me in public ever this is where we differ because i love public's displays of affection and i would have just been like yeah baby all eyes in the cafeteria on me (laughs) i know i'm a freak i'm so sorry but i would have loved it nope i would have had to have passed away yeah, there's I don't think that lady. timing was good. No, 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 no. She's traumatized. Like, that won't help. But in another time, what a left it. And she wants to, like, not be um, the subject of anybody's attention at all throughout this film. And he's like, what if everybody looked at you right now? <laughs> what if every person in this room looked at you right now and you had no idea who any of these people are for the most part because this is a not insignificantly sized school and (laughs) the killer could be among us with everybody else looking at you and now they have a reason to look at you and I I don't know I hated it um it's so not in character for her to like it and she seemed like she loved it it was so weird that's the only thing that made me think like, okay, maybe she really does like Derek. That she thought this was charming. I was like, okay, so she really just does like him, I guess. That's a good point. Uh, one quick thing that I would also like to touch on is just how absolutely stacked the uh, Stab movie is with actors. Oh. <laughs> You have oh Heather God, Graham, so good. you have Tori Spelling, you have Luke Wilson, we have never seen but mentioned David Schwimmer. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like, this movie and Luke Wilson as Billy is hilarious. So fucking funny. Like, his hair and the mannerisms, it was spot on. It was so funny. <laughs> Like, I want to see that movie made. I would love to see that whole movie and see, like, what made it into the final cut, you know? Yeah, and I want to know who they cast for Matthew Lillard. I'm glad that they didn't even try to cast someone as Stu because they never would have done it justice. (laughs) No. That would have been also a good moment to acknowledge that Tatum ever existed. I'm just saying. Right, because they don't talk about her in the movie either. And I want to know who's playing Randy also. Right? Because, like, Randy doesn't talk about who plays him. Or, no, he does. He does talk about it because he's, like, because then he goes to Dewey and he's, like, at least you have David Schwimmer playing you. Who is playing Randy? I don't think they say. Or at least I didn't catch it. I just, something I thought was so fucking funny about the casting for the fake movie inside the movie was that... No matter what, usually in the movie version of something that happened in real life, everybody's like exponentially hotter than the real life people. But in this realm, (laughs) there's no way for them to be hotter than the cast of the original Scream. There is literally no way. So it's all like five steps down. It's all like negative. (laughs) Like, sorry, Luke Wilson, you're really hot, but just like you're not skeet. You're not skeet. So You are not skeet. And then my final thing that I want to talk about is the last scene that took up so much of my time. It was so long. I mean, it is unnecessarily long. And this is the longest Scream movie of the franchise. And it is because the final scene lasted 45 hours of yes, it was exactly one year long. <laughs> I age. I'm now 28. 
It's unfortunate, but it's what happened. God. <laughs> like, it was just, it was just, there's so much, like, dead time. And also, like, if she had just, if, if Sydney had just, like, maybe used, like, five of the stage props instead of 27,000 of the stage props at the end, we really would have had a few minutes shaved off right there. But it's like, okay, here's my question, though. How did they know Sydney was going to run to the theater of all places? Which leads me to my next question, which is, why did Sydney run to the theater of all I, places? I have the answer. Like, okay. Oh. Okay, I, I was wondering that too, but if when you're watching the movie, you think it's background noise, but they're play, they're blasting music out of the theater, like blasting it super, super loud, this classical music. I don't know why that means that she thinks that she has to go there, but she does. And so she like hears it and she's like, what the heck? And then she looks at the theater and then she goes to the theater. I thought it was background music, like mood music, you know, like Hans Zimmer shit or something like that. Um, but no, they were blasting it from the theater, and then he like turns it off huh. once she gets in there. Yeah. So Sydney, I thought that same thing. So Sydney's line of reasoning is, "Oh no, my best friend just got murdered. He's definitely coming to get me. Let's run back to campus to go into the theater building where loud classical music is playing. I'll be okay, safe but there." Uh, as a lesbian, uh, the theater <laughs> is. Um, a haven and a safe space, safe space. <laughs> and it's, it's somewhere that you can really express yourself anyway please continue I'm so sorry <laughs> you know, where my mind went when Monica said that was that if she is running back to campus um her best friend has just been murdered there was a car crash she's like I need help I don't know where to go um she knows she can trust the director so maybe if she's running back to campus and she hears that there's like loud music coming from the theater, maybe she thinks there's a bunch of people inside and like a whole rehearsal yeah. going on. So maybe she's like, I will be safe around a whole bunch of people, even though that hasn't necessarily worked out for any character <laughs> in this franchise in the past. Um, but I can see why you would think that like, I need to be around a group of people and I'm right here and there are people here. I'm going to go inside so I guess I can see that connection I certainly didn't make it while we were watching and I was like why is she doing this this is the worst idea I've ever heard um so could have been more clear but maybe the original reasoning got cut out I, I don't know like maybe there was like a I think that that's I think that's got to be just what it that's, is I that's got to just be it Okay. Yeah. That makes the most um, sense. Like, that didn't yeah. register with my brain until you said it right at this very moment. <laughs> so, with this whole reveal of the killers, um, which they kept super under lock and key, apparently, even from the cast. Like, apparently, oh, they didn't get the last Sorry. pages. Oh, what's up? There were a bunch of people in the theater not long before because everybody was partying all the frat boys and the, those two gay sorority girls were in there when they were um, punishing Derek for giving his letters away. So maybe it is mm. reasonable to think that there were a bunch of people in there because there were just a bunch of people in there, but they're all gone and now. And there's big music playing. But okay, this reveal, I remember I was like shocked when I first saw it. But watching this movie again, it is so fucking obvious that Mickey is just an unhinged, batshit, crazy motherfucker <laughs> the entire time. Like, the look in his eyes the whole time. And then he, like, he just says ominous shit to everybody all the time. Like, okay, yeah, like, you're not good at pretending you're not a psycho. Why is everyone friends with you? <laughs> he thought that he was the Billy Loomis of this movie, but he was very much the stew the whole time. Yes. Well, in my mind, he was trying to do the unhinged stew monologue the way that like like Matthew Lillard had done. And I was like, honey, no, you can't do it. But also, that said, he did do a pretty good job still. <laughs> I think, he just can't be the best. I think my biggest, like, Mickey didn't shock me as the killer because, again, unhinged. But mm -hmm. when... Uh, Debbie Salt walked out and then we find out that it is Billy's mom even though she's had extensive work and has lost 60 pounds which just makes it very convenient I guess like okay yeah. sure uh, well 
to me, it's like, okay, if her husband had an affair and she leaves him, she's gonna want to Chloe Kardashian revenge body that shit. So maybe that's incidental. I mean, I can see that point, but she's doing it out of like, instead of I'm gonna get back at my cheating husband, she's doing it for I'm gonna avenge the like my psychopathic son for murder. And I mean, she had to get yoked to a yeet Casey off of Yes, but we don't know the timeline of when Mrs. Loomis left Mr. Loomis. Like, maybe she left him a few years before the... We know it was, like, before... A year before Scream, because it was before Maureen Prescott's death. So maybe it was a few years ago. She does her revenge body. She gets a little work done. And then when she returns to show her husband what he's missing out on, she discovers that Billy has been um, killed. And then she's like, I must continue my strength training so that I can (laughs) intern Phil. I'm sure she saw that shit on the news. (laughs) Or or read it in Gail Weathers' book. book. (laughs) I also want to know how her and Mickey found each other. Like, we knew... what? They say like on the on the dark web. On the dark web on a serial killer website. <laughs> what does the dark web look like in 1997? Like, how do you I access the dark web? I told you, web? I have to kill you. <laughs> it has a Comic Sans font for sure. <laughs> you have to use a dial-up modem, so it's like. <laughs> and if you can get through, if you can get through that, then you know you're unhinged and you're ready to be on the psychopath forum. Can you imagine you're just like on AOL trying to access the dark web? Somebody's like sending you an AIM. Dark web, how to? <laughs> you put up like your little AIM away message, being like, "BRB, looking for the dark web. Don't text." <laughs> Oh God! Uh, I mean, I will. I will say there's some parts of the last long, long, long scene that I did like, um, but they were only the very, very last parts of the long, long, long scene where it ended. That was the part where I like that I liked the most. I also didn't like that they kind of copied what happened in the first movie when like Gail shows up, you know, mm-hmm. and then she gets hurt, and then she comes back and she saves the day. You know, it's like just a repeat. Um, you gotta give Gail something to do, though. Otherwise, yeah, totally. she, how are you gonna bring her back for the third one if she's not there to save, to assist? Yeah, she's got to be an extri- She's got to stick her nose in it. You know, that's her whole gimmick. <laughs> if she's not there for the final showdown, how is she gonna write her second book? That's so true. Also, what a dick is Cotton for. <laughs> Maybe, you know, unless you do this Diane Sawyer interview with me, I'm going to let her murder you. Seriously. He was like, he was like really trying to get that Diane. He's like Diane Sawyer or death. Like that's literally his MO. And also I just can't stand him. Like the whole movie, he's just so annoying all the time. And he's, I just want to punch him in the face, even though his face is cute, but I still want to punch him in the face. I do think he would have saved her even if she didn't agree. I just think that those moments of hesitation would have maybe um, been disqualifying and she would have ate it either way, no matter what his intentions were. But I I Mm -hmm. have to give it to the characters in this movie. They, like, really seem to use their leverage where they can get it. Like, Cotton is like, you are about to die. Are you sure you don't want to do Diane Sawyer with me and just get a little goodwill from me and I will give you a little goodwill in turn and I will shoot this person that is going to kill you. Um, Presumably, Gail did this before the events of the movie because there are scenes in Stab that we wouldn't have if Sydney didn't tell Gail about them. Um, Like the conversation with Billy in school where he's like, can't you just get over your dead mom already? Um, So presumably Gail was like, hey, remember when I saved your life last time? Like, don't you think you could maybe do a sit down interview with me? Um, Because in the beginning of the movie, when Gail shows up for the news conference after um, Maureen Evans and Phil Stevens' death, that is when Sydney is like, she says some line that's like, be kind, she saved our lives. And then Randy goes, she had calf implants. And I just want to just give that a quick <laughs> shout out. I love that. Um, Gail I is also, also doing work, you know. 
I also love her quote to Joel at the beginning. She says, hey, you'd better check your conscience at the door, sweetie. I'm not here to be loved. Ooh. <laughs> she, okay, I think Gail has the best lines throughout this movie because I also wrote down when she says, oh. first of all, he wasn't gutted. I made that up. His throat was slashed. And that's about her cameraman, Ken. Kenny. Yeah, Kenny from the first movie. Um, And so I, I think that we, that shows, first of all, Gail did take some creative liberties. She had a little fun. Um, And I think that that, I would like to see what other changes she made in Stab, first of all. But I think Gail just is always going to be a little bit of a trash gremlin, but who comes through when it matters. You know what I mean? She always yeah. is like, at the end of the day, she's ready to do the right thing, which also they show at the end because Joel finally comes back and he's like, Gail, I'm ready to film. I'm ready to be a team with you. Joel should have returned in Scream 3. Just want to say that now. Oh, agree. Yeah. Agree. Yes. They played Joel Dust in Scream 3. Um, but he shows up at the end and Gail's like, okay, I'm ready to film. And then she sees Dewey being brought out on the stretcher after another inexplicable survival that shouldn't have happened, but I'm glad it did. The doctors say it's because of all the scar tissue that yes. saved his life. <laughs> it's because the audience loves Dewey. That's what saved his life. That's, it's true. It's true. Fan uh, favorite. But Gail finally in that moment is like, okay, something matters more to me than being famous. I'm going to rush to Dewey's side. And that was like very heartwarming um, because the scene that we, we actually didn't even talk about it at all, even though I think it is, it just, it's not my favorite death because nobody died, but it is one of my favorite attacks is when they're in the soundproof rooms with the oh. windows like that's so good that's like that so, was so incredible good. and for them to be seeing each other in that moment heart-wrenching it's heart-wrenching scene of death. the movie it's the just yeah, okay. hands down like the best scene of the movie if i was also gail how do you know when to leave the room <gasps> yeah Ugh. i would have stayed Oof. in there for years right i would have never left <laughs> Seriously. Okay. So, it's everybody's favorite part of the podcast. It is our Dumb Bitch Award. Mm -hmm. um, who would like to go first with their Dumb Bitch Award? I'll go. Okay. Um, I would first like to award an anti-Dumb Bitch Award to Jada. I thought she did everything right. Um... I also want to award an anti-dumb bitch award to Joel for getting the fuck out until the murders were done. That is so smart. Good thinking, Joel. Um, Sydney, I, you know, usually I think Sydney is like the least amount of dumb bitch that she can be. She's usually on the right track. But I got to give her a, an honorary mention um, which is like when they're in the car with Hallie and the cops are dead in the front seat, um, and somewhere outside of the car and Sydney's like climbing over the killer. She starts to go to pull the mask off and then she doesn't. Hallie's like, no. And she keeps going out. She should have pulled the mask off. She also should have reached and taken the gun out of the police officer's head and immediately shot the killer. And then she just like starts to run away with Hallie and then is like no I have to go back I need to know who it is like girl you had your moment the moment passed like at this point you need to just keep running you either needed to have taken the gun and have that for assurance at this point or you need to fire like you need to just go um so honorary mention for that um but ultimately Sydney is always very capable and always takes care of herself and there's a reason she survives every time um, so she does not get my mention, but, um, the two that I wrote down, oh, I wrote down three. Okay. Let me just decide real quick because I have Randy Dumbitch Award, but I feel like we've covered that, you know, um, Mrs. Loomis Dumbitch Award. Cause I was like, just shut up. My God. Like so much of this is your fault. <sighs> Agree. Um, you can leave your husband without abandoning your son. First of all, mm -hmm. um, and my third was Cece, Sarah Michelle Geller, because she never calls campus security back when she's inside the house and the phone is, like, presumably working again. She just stays on the phone with Ted slash the killer, which is, like, 
hang up, call security, call 911, like do something. Um, and so I have CC as my dumb bitch award, but okay. for a different reason. Ooh. Uh, my reason is why are you still talking to Ted, girl? Like, why are you answering uh, oh. these calls? It's seriously, he's drunk. He is bad for you. Your friends are even like, oh, it's your dumb boyfriend, Ted. Like, if you would have just dumped Ted, you never would have answered the phone. You would have been fine. You might have survived. And that's how I think CC is really, a That's That's, that's a, irrefutable evidence right there. My, my dumb bitch award is similar to what Chelsea was saying. Um, but mine actually goes to Sydney this time around because I'm oh. just really fucking mad at her. And you were almost about to talk about the part what I was going to talk about. But she she fucking got ha- Hallie killed. She 100% yeah. got her best friend killed. Like, yeah. they're leaving. They're running away. They totally would have made it out. And she's like, no, I need to go back. And Hallie says, stupid people go back. Smart people run. We're smart people, so we should get the fuck out of here. And then she goes back and she waits. Hallie waits for her friend, like the great friend that she is. And then she got, gets fucking murked so hard. It's horrible. It's terrible. And so for that, Sydney, you caused the death of your best friend. I still love you, but you're a dumb bitch. You had your chance, like Chelsea said. I do think Sydney in that cop scene gets the dumb bitch award. Like that, she could have ended when she would have ended the franchise, but like she did get Hallie yeah. directly killed. She did. They were but out I of have- here. I have one more potential name to throw into the ring, and that's Mickey himself, which is like, how Mm -hmm. are you going to trust somebody on the internet that's just like, hey, I think you should kill these people for me. And you're just like, okay, like, is he getting money? He's he's just getting the fame of a trial. And he thinks and like, education. that's going to work out for him. She, she, oh, that's is true. True. <laughs> oh, he's getting that's true. free education. <laughs> I didn't know he was never going to graduate. He's doing anything to get out of that student debt. <laughs> like, <Okay. relatable. laughs> But he knew he wasn't going to graduate theoretically, right? So is he a freshman or is he older? And he's like, at least I got one free year of partying out of this. Like, well, he does love film, so any m- moment in as a film studies major was really just inspiring to him. So <laughs> like, I think Hallie and Sydney were freshmen, and I think Mickey uh-huh. and Derek were like a junior senior vibe. Like I always oh, got yeah. that they were older. Because Derek is already like in the frat and like established in the frat, you know? Yeah. So mm-hmm. that makes Mickey sense. and Derek were friends. So I feel like they're the same age and then they're a lot older. Like I don't think they're yeah. sophomores. I feel like they are um, seniors or juniors. This is the way. Now this doesn't make sense because how would. Mrs. Loomis know where to send Mickey to college if Sydney hadn't even applied to colleges yet. Maybe he's a transfer. So oh. maybe he came in right after she came in. Now that's Ooh. an idea. Right? He went to junior college first. He went to junior college because he couldn't afford to go to normal college, but then he had this great opportunity where an older woman on the internet was like, I won't be your sugar mama, but if you kill people, I will pay for you to get a university education. And he's like, Even a young that sounds entrepreneur. Good. I will have my four-year bachelor's degree and I will be famous once this goes to trial. Um... Because that's all he's really looking for, but he's, like, willing to, you know, fund some college along the way. That's great planning. He's just... I take back my Mickey Dumb Bitch Award. (laughs) Other than the fact that, like, he should have known he was the stew. Timmy Timmy Oliphant. um, Timothy Oliphant (laughs) wanted what Matthew Lillard had in the first movie. Um, Mickey really brought that stew energy, which meant that he, like Stu, should have known he would be Mm. double-crossed. Wait, so who's it sounds like he did some good some good planning about what he could get out of this situation. Totally. So so who's the actual dumb bitch? Like who who have we settled upon? I think it's got to be Sydney. I don't want to do it to her, but you yeah, you're right. Like it's she did it to herself. You can't always win. Can't always be the bad bitch. Sometimes you're the dumb bitch and that's just how it is. 
she can be both. She is multifaceted. In addition to awarding the the dumb bitch um title, we also have to do our knives out of fives. This movie, I would just like to say, um, I didn't like it nearly as much as the first Scream, but it's interesting looking at the actual numbers online because I believe the first Scream on IMDb got a 7.2 out of 10. Scream 2 got a 6.2 out of 10 on IMDb, but on Rotten Tomatoes, it got 81% fresh from critics, which is 2% better, if I remember correctly, than Scream 1. However, it did get a 57% from the audience, which is probably more in line with how I felt about it. I saw this this trivia that was like, I think it was Ebert or Ropert, whatever, from Ebert, Ebert and Ropert. You know what I'm talking about? The film critics that had the TV show. The uh-huh. first one, the first one, they hated. The second one, they freaking loved it. They're like, this was incredible. And I was like, you have bad taste, but thank you for your support. I think it was a good sequel. I just don't think it was like a great movie. Yeah. And also like you watch it and you're like, wow, this is the only thing that I have right now. Cause I am a person in 1997 and I'm enjoying this. And then the next one comes out and you're like, wow, that was the worst trash I've ever seen in my life compared to scream three. So I think that because we know what's to come, this seems like shit. <laughs> but Nev did, that's true actually. Cause I feel like when we watched this originally with the OG spooky crew, I was like, Oh, this is so good. Blah, blah, blah. And it was only on a rewatch that I was like, actually scream three is the, only movie that I've ever seen in my life and it's the only movie that exists um to me and so this movie is is dirt on the ground in comparison um but Nev whose name I will pronounce correctly Nev did win the best female performance at the 1998 MTV Movie Awards the movie did not win the best movie like the first one did but Nev's performance still got um a little a little critical acclaim I agree with that. Her little theater major uh, part where she's like, Although, I'm a fighter. And then yes, she does that monologue great. from Agamemnon. Incredible. I have um, qualms with Sydney being a theater major because I, to me that was like, where the fuck did that come from? But she was very talented. She was very talented. So what's your rating? What's your rating? Yeah. Three fives out of knives. Uh, <laughs> three knives out of fives. <laughs> Three knives out of five. It's not trash. I'm sure we'll see worse, so I don't want to go too low. But to me, it's very middle of the road. You want to go next, in? So, yes. I also give this three out of five knives. Because this movie has the one thing that the other movie had. And that was... A pair like Billy and Stu that I just want to absolutely Ooh. rail me. Would not want Derek and Mickey to touch me at all. And so therefore... Neither of neither them, really. Of them. No. Neither of them. Like, Mickey would mm-hmm. be that creepy guy at the party, and Derek has a chance of singing to me in public, and I want none of that. <laughs> and so for that reason, and that reason alone, they get a three out of five knives. I I feel like we're all in agreement here. I would give it one of my super granular, like, 0.19567, whatever the hell, ratings out of five. But, like, I don't want to go lower than three because we're going to watch some (laughs) fucking shit on this podcast. And I don't want to give it higher than three because God knows it doesn't deserve that. So this is a a straight up 3.0 knives out of fives. And that's just how that's how it is. And so you're gonna have a good time watching it, but you're not gonna rewatch it as much as you would all the other ones. Yeah, but also you should have already fucking watched it if you're listening to this. So <laughs> God, <laughs> yes, don't spoil it for Monica. She will be very upset. <laughs> I already know what happens, but you need to already know what happens too because you watched it, not because we told you. But anyway, next up, what do you think we're gonna watch next? What do you guys think? Is it? What? Scream three? No. <laughs> yes, next week. I cannot. I cannot wait, and I cannot tell you how much. Um, I cannot wait. But next week we will be talking about Scream three and Scream four. It will be two episodes, so that's a little treat for you in the month of mm-hmm. October. Very spooky. Um, so you need to watch both if you're gonna be ready next Spooky Tuesday. But next Double up feature. is Scream three, and I can not 
wait. I can't wait to watch it again. If you <sighs> haven't seen it, you are in for a real good time. And if oh. you also don't think it's a good time, I don't know. I think that's a red flag for me. If you I don't guess. like Scream 3, that is the only red flag that I will acknowledge ever in my life. Sydney is known to not notice big, big issues with people, <laughs> but this is the one big, big issue that is obviously the most important red flag that there could be that she will notice, and it's over from the start if you don't like Scream 3. So Yeah, I'm not going to say if you don't like Scream 3, don't listen to this podcast because I think we will take every listen that we can get. But I will say, um, if you don't like it, just keep that thought to yourself because it's not going to go over well. No, no, no. Anyone you say that to is going to like you less if you say Anyone. that. Anyone. So. They won't even have to have seen Scream 3 and they will know in their hearts that Scream 3 is that bitch, that Scream 3 has everything right and nothing wrong, that Scream mm-hmm. 3 not only delivers on being an iconic entry into the Scream franchise, but also giving us so much more of stab you know what I mean like if you liked the elements of stab that were in scream 2 you just wait for scream 3 because it has it in spades baby I can't wait for next week all right guys that was officially the end of spooky Tuesday can't wait for you to join us next week for episode 3 if you like what you heard please go give us a five star rating and also make sure to go follow our socials both Instagram and Twitter at spooky underscore Tuesday. Spooky Tuesday was created by Monica Height, Sydney Thompson, and Chelsea Duff, and edited by Sydney Thompson. Our gorgeously spooky tunes are all thanks to Tamara Simons, who you can follow on Instagram at Captain Tamara, and our podcast art is by Mary Murphy, who you can find on Instagram at the underscore moon underscore omg. See, that's what Billy was good at. He knew. It's all about execution. Yeah. Well, you're forgetting one thing about Billy Loomis. What's that?